Hi there, Lazy D here. Today I'm working on this 2015 Polaris Ranger 900 XP. This customer reached out to me, said it's been running all right. A while ago I put uh, new fuel injectors in this one. I have a previous video if you're interested in looking at that and how I diagnosed it. But now uh, it's been probably six or eight months maybe. And now when it gets warm, it starts running like it's misfiring, he says. So I haven't really looked at this yet, but uh, I'm gonna fire it up and see what happens. This machine has uh, 5,900 miles on it. Go ahead and start it. Right now it sounds pretty normal to me. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and cycle through here. In this display, there's gonna be this temperature reading, which is the engine coolant temperature. So I'm just gonna keep an eye on this while it warms up and see kind of what temperature a problem starts to occur. It might give me a clue, but uh, as of now, it seems normal. Okay, it's been warmed up for a few. I had it on a time lapse all warmed up and I can hear it's running irregularly now. When I look at this temperature gauge, I can see there's a negative mark. It thinks it's negative 27 degrees. It's kind of bouncing around. I'm gonna watch this for a second. Now the temperature's coming back to a more normal range. And I can hear the engine smooth out. So this is indicating to me that the engine coolant temperature sensor is failing and it's giving the ECM and a regular reading which is messing with the fuel mixture and making it run like crap. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of clean this bike up and get some parts. I'll come back to this when I got the parts and everything to replace it and show you how to replace the coolant temperature sensor. These are the parts that I got to replace the coolant temperature sensor. Uh, the manual says that this machine takes six quarts, so about a gallon and a half of coolant. You'll see later when I drain it, I'm probably not going to get all of it out. So I'm guessing a gallon is going to be more than enough. I looked on Polaris's website for their branded coolant, and it is also ethylene glycol, according to the SDS for their coolant. So it may be a different mix. I've used this Napa Green stuff a ton in Polaris Rangers. It says on the back that it's uh, good for engines with aluminum. So I'm good with this. The Polaris stuff's about three times the cost of this. I did get the Polaris branded sensor which means it has a sticker that says polaris and the polaris part number on it right there but if you look at the other side of this this is a bosch sensor that number you can search it's available a bunch of places you could probably save a little bit if you wanted to get it somewhere else i got this machine lifted up to drain the coolant you don't have to do this to drain the coolant but it's going to make it a little bit easier for me to capture it all i'm not going to reuse it but i don't want to spill it everywhere so before i drain it i'm going to pop the hood off I'm just going to open the radiator cap. This is going to vent it so it doesn't get uh, vapor locked while I'm trying to drain it. And then here on the passenger side, the front, at the lower radiator hose is where Polaris recommends you drain the coolant. With most of the coolant out here, I'm gonna go ahead and put the hose back on. This should be more than enough to not spill any. And we have the coolant temperature sensor out. I'm gonna put this tension clip back where it was. To access our coolant temperature sensor, it's not gonna be under the bed here. This bed does not have the gas strut that assists lift it up. So it goes up vertical. If you wanna do that, you can just pull this pin and push this out and uh, you'll be able to get your gas strut disconnected, which will give you a little bit more access to work. The coolant temperature sensor is right down there. You can't really get a tool on it. So what I'm gonna do is disconnect some stuff and take this intake manifold off. It sounds like a big job, but it's not. It only takes a few minutes. Before I do that part, or before I work from the top here, I'm gonna show you the one bolt we're gonna need to get from the bottom 
to make this happen easy. With the bed closed, looking straight in the back, this is your intake manifold or intake plenum, they're sometimes called. This bolt right there, I'm gonna take out, it's a through bolt. It's kind of hard to see. There's a nut on the other side. They're both 13 millimeter headed. And what I'm gonna do is use my impact with an extension and a kind of wobble socket, and then just a 13 millimeter wrench to pull that out. Another couple things on the passenger side here. These three bolts on this bracket, that's also the uh, motor mount. I'm gonna loosen these up. These don't have nuts on the other side. I'm just gonna hit these three 12 millimeter headed ones. Should give me enough uh, room to wiggle out the intake manifold from that bracket. To do that, I'm gonna use this uh, impact with two extensions. It totals up about uh, 18 inches of extension in this 12 millimeter wobble socket on the end. So in order to remove the rest of the intake manifold, I'm gonna disconnect the intake ducting here at this hose clamp. I'm gonna leave the throttle body connected, but I'm gonna disconnect the uh, throttle body. I'm gonna disconnect this wiring that goes back to your tail lights and pop the clip off the bottom. This is your uh, MAP sensor, your manifold absolute pressure sensor. I'm gonna disconnect that. The two fuel injectors. And then there's another clip here, just into the manifold. You don't need to disconnect the whole wiring harness. Um, another thing here, I'm gonna disconnect this fuel line. This thing's pretty easy. You should just be able to push the two open ends of the clip away from each other. Push that out and then push this in and pull it. Disconnect that. A lot of these clips here, they have a spot to push with your thumb. I find it a lot easier to sneak a pick tool underneath, get them disconnected and push them off. There's a few clips here that hold this harness going along the top. You should clip to one of those and kind of easily pry them. They should come out. That's just an eight millimeter hose clamp or five sixteenths. So should be getting pretty close here. I'm on the passenger side now. One of the last things I'm gonna have to disconnect are these intake adapters. If you look in from the side here, try to zoom in. There's two Phillips headed hose clamps. I have about a uh, 18 inch long flathead screwdriver I'm gonna to use to just loosen those up. Just gonna sneak right in here. Now with everything loose, you should be able to give this guy the tug. And get the whole intake manifold out of the way. So these coolant temperature sensors can be a little bit difficult to disconnect. I'm gonna use a set of needle nose pliers to just squeeze gently and push in like you're trying to push it on tighter and wiggle it back and forth as I do that until I get this to release. So that's out. Now it can be quite difficult. This coolant temperature sensor 
is a 19 millimeter. I have this offset wrench, which is gold. I don't know why it's gold. It was the cheapest one I could find on Amazon. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that over on here. And once I get that just cracked loose, I should just be able to unthread it by hand. There's a crush washer on here. And a little bit of coolant's still coming out, but there's a crush washer. Make sure that comes off with it and your new sensor will have one of those. I'm gonna go ahead and thread in, make sure that uh, ceiling surface is clean. I'm gonna thread in my new coolant temperature sensor here. I'm gonna put the torque up here. It's probably gonna be pretty hard to get a torque wrench of any sort on here, but uh, you know, use your best judgment. And it just needs to crush that washer just a little bit. Another thing I wanna point out, the thermostat is right here. These are pretty difficult to get to. If uh, you're doing this job, you may wanna get yourself a new thermostat and go ahead and put it in. It's just two eight millimeters right here. This will pop off, you put the new one in, and uh, you're good to go. To assemble all this is just gonna be the reverse of uh, disassembly. I'm not gonna capture all of it. I'll maybe do a time lapse here. buttoned up here the last thing i gotta do is fill this thing up with coolant you can see here i have one of these spill free funnels here's the lid off it has the the lyle part number these are pretty handy i can just leave this attached and fill this with coolant and then i'll let it warm up and purge all the bubbles out i'll let it get all the way up to operating temperature so any air gets out of the system and then i'm going to top off the overflow With our spill-free funnel full, it's important that we bleed the air out of the cylinder head or at the cylinder head before we start it to get any air out. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna remove these two 10 millimeter bolts here and then in the back of the cylinder head right there by the exhaust is the coolant bleed screw. The coolant bleed screw is an eight millimeter headed screw. I'm gonna go ahead and loosen it. Mine's already a little warm. I should have done this before, so make sure you do this when it's cold. So we're just going to let this bleed until coolant comes out. It's, maybe you can hear it. There's air coming out right now. You don't have to remove this all the way. Just like that. Now that most of the coolant's gone in, I'm gonna fire this up. As you can see from the time lapse, the 
coolant temperature has been acting a lot more stable and it's been in a normal range. Uh, I've heard the fan kick on and off a few times and the temperature's staying in that range. I'm just gonna let it run a little bit longer. You can see there's just some little bubbles coming out. This is uh, totally normal. Sometimes it takes a little bit to get the last of the air out. After uh, this is full, last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna top off the coolant reservoir. This is the max cold level. Probably gonna fill it up to about here, quite a bit above it. It's hot now. As this cools down, it's gonna pull some of the coolant back in the engine once I put the radiator cap back on. And uh, after everything cools off, I'll run it again up to operating temperature with the system closed and the cap on, and then just check our level one more time before letting this leave my hands and go back to the customer. Hopefully this video is helpful to you. It sucks when your machine's having problems and uh, sometimes things aren't so easy to get to like this coolant temperature sensor, but uh, overall not too bad. It takes a little while. Just take your time. If uh, this was helpful to you, please like, comment, or subscribe. Thank you.